Well, good morning, Maitland Perez. Uh, today is Palm Sunday. We got a big palm in our yard. <laughs> and if you've been around the church long enough, this probably isn't your first one, but it probably is your weirdest one. For sure. Uh, if you're new to all things churchy, uh, Palm Sunday, let me put this behind us here, is a, this is a big one. Uh, Palm Sunday is the beginning of Holy Week, the biggest, most important week of the Christian year. All of Jesus' three-year-long ministry leads up to, to, to these days in his life, and, and to this day uh, leads to the cross and to the resurrection. So we have a few announcements before we begin. Uh, we do have a few extra things this week because it's Holy Week. We would so much rather be with you, but we're going to try and make this week a good one and a memorable one together. Uh, so Monday, Thursday, we'll have a cooking class uh, right at noon. I will be cooking unleavened bread, so grab some flour, join us in your kitchen. That evening at 7 p.m. on Monday, Thursday, bring some bread and some juice or some wine and uh, sit at your dining room table, meet us live online, and we'll be doing a sort of experiential Last Supper together as we remember that last dinner that Jesus had with his disciples. On Good Friday, also at 7 p.m., we'll do a tenebrae service, uh, which is a time when the light gets less and less as we prepare to remember the crucifixion of Christ. So if you have seven candles in your home that you can gather up, get out your hurricane supplies, pull them out, I have those ready if you want to experience that with us, or you can certainly just watch it. And then on Easter morning, we'll have sunrise at 7 a.m. That'll be a live service, and we'll have another service like what we've been doing at 10. And so you can come to either or both of those as we celebrate Easter until we can be together again. We'd love for you to participate in our virtual choirs, so, so get those videos into us by, by Wednesday so we have time to get them all put together. And uh, But now it's Palm Sunday, so mm -hmm. we've got palms, uh, we've got music, and we are all together in spirit and in time, if not in place. So let's worship God. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us for Sunday School this morning. It's April, which means we have new stuff to learn this month as we build up to Easter. Um, and we'll get to that later in the week. I'll have a special lesson for you um, on Thursday. But this morning, I want to show you how to make one of these little crosses out of palm leaves because um, today we are celebrating Palm Sunday and it's the day that we celebrate when Jesus came into Jerusalem. It's the start of Holy Week for us as we build into Easter next Sunday. So I'm going to show you how to make one of these at home. If you don't have a palmetto bush, that's okay. Um, you can, any long strip of paper will do. It doesn't have to be green. It can be any color. The shorter your leaf, the smaller your cross. So you might want to think about that when you're doing it. So I'm going to walk through the steps so that you guys can learn how to make these. So here we go. All right, first, you're going to come not quite halfway, maybe right here. And you're going to fold it at an angle. So we get like a little triangle here. And then this guy is going to fold back this way until we're even with the side of the leaf there. Then this guy's going to come around and then we're just going to hold it like that. Then you're going to take the bottom part, going to come up and weave it through the middle of, whoops, middle of the cross. And you're going to pull it all the way through. Try to hold everything together here. Everybody stay together. Then we'll take this and we're going to pull it all the way through. And that should hold everything together nice and tight and you'll have like a little right angle there. Then we're going to take this guy and he's going to come through the middle and then back up. I didn't leave enough room here. I'm tucking back in here on the back side. Okay. And this guy is going to go in here. Nope, not in here. It goes this way. I've done this before, I promise. I'm going to pull it through. 
And then you'll take him and tuck him back in on this side. And that is how you make a cross out of a palm leaf. So that's our lesson for today. Like I said, look out for another lesson on Thursday that'll be all um, tying into Holy Week and Easter, and we're going to learn about the Last Supper that Jesus had with his disciples. So thanks for being here this morning. Bye, guys. We're going to keep working on these because <laughs> we're not quite there yet. But thank you, Vanessa, for that awesome Palm Sunday activity. Tied mine into a knot. <laughs> now let's go to God and worship with a song from Matthew.
name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus. Thanks, Matthew. That was awesome. Uh, now we've got some videos that you all made of uh, your, the palms that you cut off and put in the street to, to, to celebrate Palm Sunday together today. So we're just going to watch those real quick and uh, let's, let's enjoy those together. Hosanna! 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 Hosanna. Hosanna. welcoming Jesus to our home this Palm Sunday. Hosanna in the highest. Come Jesus, come. Thanks everyone for participating in that Palm Sunday project with us. Now let us be ministered to you by the word of God. Kara and Bobby will be reading our scripture this morning. Let's listen. Today's reading is going to be from John 12, 12 through 19. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it as it is written. Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first. But when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. So the crowd that had been with him when Lazarus, when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to testify. It was also because they heard that he had performed the sign that the crowd went to meet him. The Pharisees then said to one another, you see, you can do nothing. Look, the world has gone after him. Thanks, Bobby and Kara. So this morning, we're going to start with a question. Are you ready? Okay. Have you ever wished that someone could just come and make it all better? Oh, yeah. Right? I'm wishing that pretty hard right now. Like, all the time. And on a non-pandemic, non-weird Palm Sunday like it is today, we would have to spend some time at the beginning trying to help us all connect with that feeling that the people of Jesus' time were experiencing. That feeling of just wishing for someone to come and to make everything better. But this year we not to do that because we can all relate. This time you feel it and you know it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's safe to say that we get it now. Mm -hmm. I mean, our situation is different than it was then, but the right. longing is the same. 
For Israel, uh, their longing came from being conquered over and over again by one empire and then another. One empire carted them away from their homeland. The next one brought them back but still ruled them. Then they ruled themselves for a little while, only to be conquered by the Romans, who stationed soldiers all around the city to keep the people in check. Now, some of the people, uh, the people of Israel, they collaborated with the enemy. Uh, sometimes people weren't sure who they could trust. And this occupation, as you can imagine, took quite a toll on the people of Israel. Every day was a struggle. Every week became more and more difficult. And then every Sabbath, they would read in their scriptures about how God had destroyed Israel's enemies before. They read in Exodus about how God had saved them from slavery in Egypt and drowned their oppressors in the Red Sea. Uh, in the Psalms, they would read that the one who guarded Israel would neither slumber nor sleep. That's right. And then in the prophets, they read about those who had saved Israel in the past. And then week after week, year after year, they began to really believe someone was coming. Someone was coming who would save their future. And when he did that, that he would restore Israel's rightful place in the world. Because that's what they had been promised. They read passages like uh, Zechariah 9, uh, verse 9 and 10, that says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter Jerusalem. Lo, your king comes to you. Triumphant and victorious is he, humble and riding on a donkey on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Then verse 10, he will cut off the chariot from Ephraim and the war horse from Jerusalem, and the battle bow shall be cut off, and he shall command peace to the nations. His dominion shall be from sea to sea, and from the river to the ends of the earth. Now keep in mind that not only was this Israel's holy text, but for the vast majority of them, it was one of their only texts. It was all they had to think about. It was their Netflix, it was their <laughs> YouTube. So they knew it pretty well. And all of this longing and expectation and, and wishing for someone to come along and conquer their enemies to make it all better, all of that is leading up to our story today of Palm Sunday. So when Jesus came into Jerusalem that very first day, he knew what he was doing. He knew what he was doing when he rode in on a donkey, when he accepted all those palm branches they were laying at his feet. The prophecies that they had already read said the Messiah, that when they had been wishing would come and make everything better, would ride into town on a donkey and not some huge war horse, but a donkey, because that's what their God is like. So they cut down palm branches from trees and they waved them in the air and then they laid them down at his feet so he could walk on them. And that's when they cried out. And this is in chapter 12. Of John. Of John, that's right, verse 12. And it says right here, oh, sorry, verse 13, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. And the people weren't calling Jesus like their, their spiritual king. Right. They wanted him to be their actual king, the kind of king who would like ride up to a Roman soldier and just punch him and start the war that would liberate Israel. Jesus knew all of that. He knew what they'd been waiting for. He knew that they were longing for him to take over and defeat their enemies. Mm -hmm. Even if he hadn't been all-knowing, he would have known all of that. So he rode in like that hero, like a deliverer, like the Messiah anyway. He rode the donkey because he wanted the people to know that he knew. But then he didn't do what they expected him to do. And the people were disappointed. Exactly. So then let's look at verse 16. And it says, His disciples did not understand these things at first. Even the disciples, and that's the people who were closest to Jesus than anyone, didn't understand what he was up to. They, they were disappointed and they didn't understand why he was doing what he was doing. But then it goes on and says, But when Jesus was glorified, they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. So it was only after Jesus died and then rose from the dead that all of this stuff would make sense to them. It was in that moment on Palm Sunday that even his closest friends were as caught up in the parade and the palms as everybody else. It would only be on the other side of Easter that they understood what Jesus had really done, what he did. So Jesus knew what they were wishing for. He knew what they were hoping for, 
and he knew they were disappointed. But he did it anyway, because Jesus had something better. You know, the people thought that if someone just solved their political problems, that life would be good again. They thought if they got the freedom they craved, then they would be happy. You know, a, a quick note about this idea in light of our current situation, because this is a mistake that a lot of people are making right now. If you're still going out when you don't have to, please stop. Exercising your freedom just because you can won't make you any happier. You'll still be in the same situation tomorrow. A little temporary escape won't fix anything. In fact, it might just put your life and the lives of those you love at risk. All right, so back to our people in the story. They wanted someone who would make it all go away overnight. But God didn't send Jesus to give them that temporary fix. God didn't send a Messiah who would just liberate the people of Israel or who would destroy the nation that they had been fighting against right then. Instead, God sent his savior who disappointed all of those expectations because what God had to give was and is now so much better. God sent them love in a way that would change their lives forever and that would give them that true freedom and that hope that they were actually longing for because it wasn't based in one leader that would help one community. It was based in the true love of God who loved the whole world. Frederick Buechner uh, puts it much better than we can. He's very smart. <laughs> <laughs> he, says, he says this, he says, the power of God stands in violent contrast with the power of man. It is not external like man's power, but internal. By applying external pressure, I can make a person do what I want him to do. That is man's power. But as for making him be what I want him to be, without at the same time destroying his freedom, only love can make this happen. And love makes it happen not coercively, but by creating a situation in which of our own free will, we want to be what love wants us to be. So as you and I face this unimaginable time together, that kind of love is exactly what we need. People have been asking us some questions over the past few weeks, and the first one is always, why is God letting this happen? And the short answer is, we don't know. I mean, we know that we're human, and that viruses are part of the world that we live in, but why this one, why now, and why God? Uh, these are questions that none of us can answer. But the second question is this, where is God? And that answer to that one is much more clear. God is working internally, like Beekner talked about, in you. God is loving you into the person that God needs you to be right now, in this time. Jesus taught this in a way that all the best teachers teach by letting his disciples learn it for themselves, by, by creating a situation in which of our own free will, we want to be what love wants us to be. Jesus's procession into Jerusalem with the palms waving and the crowds yelling towards him, it was never about power. It was always about love. A love that brought God to be here with us in person because we couldn't hear him otherwise. A love that would carry him through this week and finally to the cross. This was the love that would change the world, starting with us. This same Jesus who chose love over power, donkeys over horses, the cross over an army, loves you. That's right. He loves you so much that he wants you to learn to love the way that he does. Not in general, but in every situation you find yourself in including this one. So where's God? God's in you, leading you to love like Jesus. God's in those of you who are pouring out into our community in medical work or in grocery stores or all of those other essential jobs that make it so you can't stay home like the rest of us. God is in you who are staying at home, choosing to love others by setting aside the plans you had in order to love your neighbor. And God is in you as you see past your own expectations for what should be past your own plans and instead are asking God how you can do your part. 
God is in you. As you lay down your palm branch and welcome the Savior of the world, who saves not by magically fixing everything, but by dying and rising again, so that you and me and everyone else can love like Jesus. Thanks for being with us this morning. Next, we're going to hear from a couple of our church members as we prepare to take our offering. So let's listen now from Bill and Carol Avery. To say that these are unsettled times would be a gross understatement. We have never lived through a pandemic of this scale in our lifetime. We're concerned about the health and welfare of our family and friends, about social isolation, and especially about the economic impact, both individually and globally. In the midst of this, God and our church give us hope. When this is over, we want to assure that our whole church staff can hit the ground running. Bill and I continue to give so others will be blessed. And if you're able, please join us in supporting our church through our tithes and offerings. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone, for supporting the work of our church through the giving of your tithes and offerings. Uh, and now we're going to be led in prayer by our seminary intern, Sharon Tatum. Today is Palm Sunday, and it is the day that we remember what the Lord has done for us. My name is Sharon Tatum, and I am a seminary student at Dubuque University in Dubuque, Iowa. And I'm also an intern here at Mainland Presbyterian Church. Welcome. 
Please go with me in prayer wherever you are, in your home, on your sofa, on your lanai, in your kitchen. Let us focus on our prayer to God. Please bow your heads. Wondrous and merciful Prince of Peace, with enduring gratefulness, we recall that you entered Jerusalem to an adoring crowd who cried out to you, Hosanna, save us. In peace, you strode in on a donkey, triumphant and victorious. On a mission to redeem your people, you humbled yourself and carried the cross of our redemption when they persecuted you. We confess that we call out to you to help us, yet we run swiftly to follow the crowd instead of diligently following you and your example of humanity and humility. And that sometimes, like Peter, we stand idle or even deny you in mind and deed while others crucify you again and again. And we know in our hearts that to follow you, we must deny ourselves. Yet we often fail miserably. In your mercy, Lord, forgive us. Reconcile to you your children who gather right now from near and far across the vast and spacious wilderness. Grant us the same mind that was in Jesus Christ. Remove us from our comfort zone. Unite our will to your will that we may run the way of your commandments and receive the crown of steadfast love and mercy that takes us from everlasting to everlasting. Grant us abundant joy, peace, and hope so that we may forever glorify you. Accept the lost into the fold. Guide them back who turn away from you. Strengthen those who have illness in their minds and bodies. Restore sight to the blind. Remember all who need a helping hand. To the homeless, the children, the forgetful, the misunderstood, the confused, the fool and comfort those who mourn. Advise those who lead in government. Reveal truth to your people as we seek to consume the meat of your word. Protect the abused and empower them to stand up. Vindicate the oppressed, lead the youth, and encourage their hearts through these trying times. Restore and preserve marriages in abundant love and grace. Bestow favor upon the co-pastors of this congregation and enlarge their territory. Remind us daily to be like Jesus, to act like Jesus, to live like Jesus, to love like Jesus, to forgive like Jesus, and to pray like Jesus taught his disciples to pray. Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and forever. Amen. God be with you until we meet again. Thanks for joining us in worship today. We hope to see you during the rest of Holy Week. Now may you feel God's blessing and sense of peace with you today. And as you go from this, this time, may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, be with those you love, and be with those who no one loves. Amen. Amen. Bye, guys.